Okay, welcome back everyone. <laughs> What I was trying to tell you was we were having, I was in the middle of having a great conversation, which I hope is what all of you are doing, <laughs> hence I missed my cue. Anyway, so we have our next keynote presentation and we're going to do this for the next 15 minutes. And then after that, Michael Fenbeck is going to bring two other people onto the stage for a conversation. But before we do that, we are absolutely delighted to have this particular Sorry. keynote presentation. And this is Helga Stevens, who is the MEP, Member of the European Parliament from Belgium. And also, she's going to give her own personal experience. And I think it's our first time having you here at the Zero Conference. So we, would you please give her a very, very warm round of applause. It's three o'clock, so come on, everybody. Warm round of applause. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you can see the title of my presentation is Next, Next Level P Political Participation. I am the first female member of the European Parliament. We have to remember that before I entered the European Parliament, I was a member of the Belgian Senate and the Belgian par Parliament. I've also served uh, on the local city council in Ghent, Belgium, uh, for a total of 12 years. Uh, my political experience um, past, in the past 12 years um, precedes my experience within the political party that I'm a member. Uh, I want to start digging right into the UNCRPD. Uh, this links directly to the theme of this conference, uh, which is employment, uh, work, vocational, education, and training. Now, let's look at how this ties in with the convention and what the link between politics and work might be. If you look at Article 29 in the convention, it mentions uh, participation in political and public life. State parties shall undertake to ensure that persons with disabilities can effectively vote and be elected, which means politics is not only about participating in the vote, it's about standing for election and about being elected, and not only a passive um, participation. You have active uh, participation as well. So the link to work and employment uh, shows through in Article 27, which states the state parties have to recognize the right of persons with disabilities to work on an equal basis with other, others and to ensure that reasonable accommodation is provided to persons with disabilities in the workplace. So the link between politics and work if you look at my job as a politician, I work in a workplace. My workplace is the parliament. Either the Flemish parliament, the Belgian Senate, and now the European parliament, this is my workplace. And so that's the link between articles 29 and 27 and to the theme of this year's conference. If we dig deeper into the concept of reasonable accommodation at the European Parliament, so I'm going to use myself as a case study here. The concept of reasonable accommodation is very broad. It is also very uh, adaptable to each disabled person's situation. I don't have enough time to go into my experiences uh, at the Belgian uh, Senate and the Belgian Parliament, so I will just use the current situation in the European Parliament. Now, the situation of myself as an elected official is different than the situation of a staff member or a trainee or intern. Uh, you're employed by the political group, uh, which is the situation of an intern, uh, and you can also be employed by a member of European Parliament themselves. And you might think that, okay, this is the same type of reasonable accommodation because it's all happening basically in the same building. But in fact, that's not the case. Each one of these situations um, is different. The European Parliament likes to complicate things while I like to keep things simple. Welcome to politics. 
If we look at the situation of myself, uh, elected official, after the election, before each mandate starts, there is an assessment of each member who has a disability. That may be a wheelchair user, uh, a blind member, or a deaf member like myself. But it's kind of silly because everyone knows I'm deaf. I don't know why they have to assess the fact that I'm deaf. But anyway, so I ha you get a medical certificate that proves you have a disability and which type of disability and then what the needs are attached uh, and that becomes your reasonable accommodation. Uh, that then gets passed on to a uh, bureau of peers who are responsible for a budget, uh, which goes to MEPs with disabilities like myself. So I requested sign language interpreters, and they decided what the budget for sign language interpreters would be, um, and to my surprise, the budget was much, much less uh, compared to what I was getting at the Flemish Parliament uh, and the Belgian Senate, you would imagine that because the European Parliament is a bigger institution that you would get the same or more allocation for reasonable accommodation, but in fact it was the opposite, and we're still um, fighting that fight. Now, if you're a staff person working at the European Parliament, there are staff regulations uh, which uh, they have to follow, and that is after a medical assessment, as I uh, explained to you before. Trainees and interns also would have um, an individual assessment at the start of their employment, uh, and then they would be given reasonable accommodation uh, that was suitable. But the, the, the political parties would be the ones responsible to pay for that reasonable accommodation. Uh, now, if you look, at the socialists, the Christian Democrats, the conservatives, the Greens, all of the different political parties, we have eight in the European Parliament, they all receive a budget for employing people to be able to function as a political party. So the idea is that from that budget, they should be able to pay for a reasonable accommodation as well. And I can follow that logic. But at the same time, it's not exactly fair because the biggest political group, which has over 250 members, in compared to the smallest group, which might have uh, 50 or 60 members, is going to have a, a much bigger budget to handle interns or trainees that have a disability. So if smaller groups are more keen to hire um, people with disabilities, they have a much larger burden compared to the gr bigger groups. So I think the system is not very just because political groups, in fact, are not encouraged to hire people with disabilities based uh, on this logic, but that's the system we have to deal with now. If I hire an intern with a disability, and I have had deaf interns in my office in the past, and I ask the parliament to provide an interpreter for that intern, they say, it's not our problem, it's your problem, you're the one who decided to hire them. And I, sa I said, now, uh, this is ridiculous because it's not fair. The responsibility is on the, the individual member of European parliament. This discourages members to have uh, interns who have disabilities, and this is really not fair. I, fe I feel like we should have a separate fund to encourage both the administration, members of European Parliament, and the political groups to hire people with disabilities to work in the Parliament as an intern or as a staff member. So I want to go a little bit more in depth about my own personal experience there are regulations for members of parliament with disabilities. At this moment, we have five members with disabilities, um, two deaf members, including myself, two wheelchair users, and one woman with uh, severe vision problems and uh, health problems that go along with that. Uh, there might be um, others who have a mild hearing loss, but they don't uh, declare that as a disability. Uh, 
there's also another uh, member who has very bad eyesight in one of his eyes, but he's not declared himself as a member with disabilities. So out of the five who have declared themselves, um, two of us are deaf, as I said, and if you look at the rules, they're the same for both of us. But the application of the rules is completely different between the two of us. We don't have the same provision for sign language interpreters, for example. The other deaf member has been in parliament, um, this is his second term. Uh, so he was the only deaf member. And then in 2014, I joined the parliament and then we were two. The administration decided that the situation of the other deaf member was the same as the first mandate. And he did not get a very good um, deal out of it from the administration. So we're trying to improve the situation for sign language interpreters to be allowed to work more hours and to allow flexibility. The parliament follows your language, which makes sense in a lot of ways. We have 24 official languages, spoken languages at, in, in the parliament. And you can ask for um, a personal interpretation, but it follows your language profile. So I sign, yes, but I also know English and I'm literate in English. I know American Sign Language. Right now I'm using American Sign Language because the working language of this conference is English. So uh, I've asked, I ask Parliament to provide me with two interpreters, uh, a Flemish Sign Language interpreter uh, who is a Dutch speaking and then a native English uh, sign language interpreter who uses uh, ASL most of the time. At the end of the day, the budget is the same if we have two Flemish sign language interpreters or one Flemish and one English. But getting to this point was very, very difficult. For my other colleague, they won't accept that because they made the decision six years ago. They're, they're not very flexible and that is not fair. So we're now taking this um, up to the president of the parliament um, and our patience has basically run out. So hopefully we see some changes there. Sign language uh, is important. Um, sign language interpreters are important because it's the only way for deaf politicians to participate in the process. Politics is all about communication and without interpreters, I am without the ability to communicate with my peers and with my public. Last year, we set up a huge conference in September at the European Parliament. We had over 1,000 participants from all over Europe. That conference had all 24 spoken languages and all 31 sign languages simultaneously interpreted during the entire uh, duration of the conference. There was a resolution as a result of this conference and we achieved this resolution by a large majority in plenary. I think we only had five members abstain and two people against who then changed their minds uh, later with some persuasion. Uh, but it was uh, unprecedented. This resolution is very important because we've had resolutions in the past about sign language from 1988 uh, that focused uh, on languages, of making sure that sign languages were official languages for deaf people. Nothing really happened and then 10 years later in 1998, uh, we had a repeat uh, resolution which was uh, a bit stronger and we then saw that begin to be implemented because now most um, EU member states have sign languages recognized uh, in their constitution, in their law, or in an act. And so we've seen sign languages have more official status. So sign languages themselves have been uh, improved on paper, but what we haven't seen is the gap that this third resolution fills, which is, to look at the professionalism of sign language interpreters and to have them equal to spoken language interpreters. The European Parliament employs a large number of spoken language interpreters, as you can imagine, with 24 official spoken languages. They work in teams of three. 
they also have working conditions where they're not allowed to work for more than four hours without a um, two hour break. I have two interpreters who don't get any breaks. They work all day long and they're paid much less than the spoken language interpreters who are doing exactly the same work. So we're trying to, to change that and that's what the most recent resolution was all about. So we have to implement this uh, in the future. There's also a report on the UN Convention on the Rights of Peoples with Disabilities, and that also is an important tool to show the European Union and the member states uh, by proxy how to implement the UNCRPD. So I was the rapporteur of that report, and we had a lot of committees um, input their opinions and other non-governmental organizations um, influence the the result of that report. So it's increased access in general at the European Parliament. Before we had no meetings that were accessible and because of the UNCRPD, the European Parliament and European institutions have become more aware that they need to provide accessibility and that's what's happening on an ad hoc basis for some meetings. I, I know I have to close. I want to just last mention OSCE, which is the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. They've recently set up a project to focus on improving the participation of disabled people in public life, including politics, and I would invite you to read this. Accessibility is such an important uh, part of people's right to participate in public life. Without access, it doesn't matter what the disability, you can't participate. So we have to remove barriers. We have to think creatively. We, we also have to think about how inclusive education comes into the picture here. We have to look at how disabled people are portrayed in the media, and we have to increase the, um, the this percentage of disabled people in um, mass media. Uh, we also have to look and monitor uh, data so that uh, countries can benchmark themselves and see what kind of progress they're making. So this is a wonderful project from OSCE, and, and again, I recommend you look into that. My time, unfortunately, has run out, so I will now um, close my keynote. If you would like to contact me, here are my details. Thank you very much for your attention. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Helga. Um, to hear your, the frustration of, of what you, you have more patience than I can imagine. And it is extraordinary to see an, an interpreter for sign language is paid less than a language interpreter. It's, it's unfathomable, <laughs> really. Thank you so much for continuing to advocate and thank you so much for being here and sharing your personal story. Please continue to do so. We really, really appreciate it.